Good afternoon, and welcome to Interesting Music. I thought that we might today talk about Gustav Mahler, born 1860, died 1911, and specifically about his 10th symphony, of which I just happen to have a copy right here. But um, there's some fine print on the front page. A performing version of the draft for the 10th symphony prepared by Derek Cook. What does that mean? Well, when Mahler died, there were rumours that he was working on a 10th symphony, and those rumours were true. But for reasons of her own, his widow, Alma, took the manuscript and locked it away in a box. And so people assumed that all that there was of the symphony was just, you know, jottings and ideas and notes and really not much more than fragments. And they got around, they got to be this legend, I suppose, of this romantic legend that there was this lost symphony where Mahler had started to put his thoughts down on paper, but it would never be heard. And that's how it might have stayed until about 13 years after Mahler died, when a friend of Alma's suggested that they have a look through the manuscript. And to their considerable surprise, they discovered that in fact, Mahler had finished the first two movements in full orchestral score. This is what the start of the piece looks like. It starts, as all symphonies should, with a long viola solo, but then we turn the page and here's the first page of music for the full orchestra. It certainly doesn't have the final polish that Mahler gave his completely finished works, but it only needed to be edited to make it playable. So that's what Alma did. She had the first and third movements published so that they could be played, and at the same time she had the entire manuscript, all of the sketches, printed as a facsimile edition. What do I mean by that? Um, 
a facsimile edition is one where the composer's entire manuscript is essentially reproduced as close to lifelike as possible. Um, oh, I can show you one. Put this back down because this, this is one of the most beautiful things that I own. This is a facsimile of Mahler's very greatest song, Ich bin der Welt abhanden gekommen. And, open it up, we can see. It's life-size, pretty much. Um, well, no, it is life-size. It's exactly the same size as Mahler's, Mahler's manuscript was. You can see he wrote in ink. Um, and beautiful, very neat writing, actually. It's, it's really lovely. Um, they even reproduce... Oh, you can, you can see I'll bring it in closer. It's a blue, blue pencil where he's written a tempo indication. Um, and you can even... They even go so far as to reproduce the blank pages at the end of the book, the blank pages of manuscript paper that Mahler never actually wrote on. It's that, it's that detailed. Um, Mahler's, Mahler's working methods. The way that Mahler worked was that he would start by sketching the entire piece from beginning to end, usually on four or five staves, and then he would go back to the beginning and start orchestrating it. So, we know that Mahler had orchestrated the first two movements and therefore we would assume that he had sketched the whole piece. And in fact, he had. This is the start of the last movement, the, the fifth movement. It's on four staves and you can see where he's made a few notes to himself. Uh, here he writes FL, which of course stands for flute. Um, and here he's got a few vertical slash marks for some reason. Um, and here he writes VL for violins, PPP. So look, you can see it's pretty messy, but this is the skeleton of what Mahler would have turned into an orchestral score. But the funny thing is that when Alma published that facsimile of the sketches, not that many people looked at it properly. Because the few who did were always immeasurably surprised to discover that the whole piece was, as Mahler himself had said, complete as a sketch. The most consequential of the people to really look at it seriously was an English musicologist called Derek Cook. He was asked to write a book on Mahler, and because he was not the kind of bloke to do things by halves, he got hold of a copy of the facsimile and he transcribed it. And then he went a bit further and fleshed it out into a full orchestral score. And here it is. It was first performed in 1960, and after nearly 50 years, Mahler's lost symphony was restored to life. Now, this score is absolutely fascinating because, um, well, let me show you. After, after the 25th bar or so of the third movement, this big thick black line, that's where Mahler's manuscript stops. And at the bottom of the page, you can see that they, the publishers have laid out a transcription of the sketch. So, you can see a considerably tidied up version of what we saw before. And because it's right underneath the same point in the full score, you can compare that with Cook's reconstruction. Cook had to make some ingenious deductions when he was orchestrating these sketches. And I'd like to go and have a listen to one of the ones which is immediately audible. We're going to listen to the bit for which we've in fact already seen the sketches right at the start of the fifth movement. And to save, to save you from looking at Mahler's handwriting, which I must say does take some practice to decipher, um, we're going to look at the tidied up version of the sketch. And I want you to keep an eye out for those vertical slashes that we looked at before. Here we go.
that flute solo is just one of the great glories of the instrument. It's so beautiful. Um, Derek Cook actually said that when he first heard that solo, he knew that all of his work on the symphony had been worthwhile. It does raise an interesting point, um, and that is how ethical it is to complete a work that an artist has left unfinished. There are still quite a lot of conductors around who won't, won't touch this piece. They won't go near it because they say that it's not real Mahler. Well, no, it's not. The first person who would have agreed with that is Derek Cook. I mean, that's, that's why there's the fine print on the front cover. We call this Mahler's Tenth Symphony because that's you know, convenient, but it's not. It's a representation of the stage that the work had reached when Mahler died. That's a very fine distinction, and it's one, as I say, it's one of which Cook was profoundly aware. He wrote, he wrote a bit about it in the foreword to the, to the score, actually. He says, um, the only realistic question is this. In the absence of Mahler's own final definitive work, does his comprehensive draft, even filled out and put into score by other hands, provide a Mahlerian experience of value? And he goes on to say, I believe that it does, for one simple reason. Mahler's actual music, even in its unperfected and unelaborated state, has such significance, strength and beauty that it dwarfs into insignificance the momentary uncertainties about pastiche composing. After all, the thematic line throughout, and something like 90% of the counterpoint and harmony, are pure Mahler, and vintage Mahler at that. But the acid test of this piece was Alma, Mahler's widow. In 1960, she gave the BBC permission to broadcast Cook's realisation, but then she changed her mind and insisted that no further performances take place until a friend managed to persuade her to listen to a tape of the broadcast. She was moved to tears. She said that she had not realised how much mala there was in it. The first thing that she did was write to Cook and lift the ban. Well, actually, no, that's, that's not the first thing she did. The first thing that she did was to ask to have the tape played again. Now, if this were a normal, interesting music, and we were together in Old Cran, then what I would do now is play the last movement of the symphony. But we're not. We're, we're in my library, uh, so, so I won't. Um, but what I have done is put it up online at www.bordermusiccamp.org.au slash mala10. And look, download it. Have a listen to it. Um, it it's about, it goes for about an hour and a quarter. Um, I can't say in all honesty that it can be described as particularly easy listening, but it is an amazing piece of music. Um, the first movement after the viola solo uh, has this extraordinarily convoluted, you know, lush, decadent harmony, and it finishes with this scream of pain from the whole orchestra. The second movement is quite crazy. Um, the third movement has got this sort of sinuous earworm that gets in your head and just won't get out. Um, the fourth movement sort of goes inexorably towards that amazing music that we heard at the start of the fifth movement, of the last movement. The viola solo comes back at the end of the piece, but this time it's played by the whole horn section, and so the whole thing comes full circle and the piece finishes in a mood of beatific calm. It's an extraordinary piece. It's, yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. Download it, listen to it. And I hope that you have enjoyed this interesting music and I hope that you have found it interesting. <laughs> Thank you.